Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where I have an intriguing story for you all today and a fresh approach to technology development. Because after recent news with MI6 recently outlining plans to use technology developed by outside companies for the very first time, John Reeves from Viasat is going to be joining us to discuss why governments and bodies such as the MOD need to perform the same type of cultural shift. So I've asked him to come on and expand on how and why using commercial technology with the right approach and controls in place can offer more opportunities to innovate, adapt and develop the best capabilities against the rise of the increasingly advanced and sophisticated adversaries out there. After all, ultimately, it's all about getting tech in the hands of the people in the field. So I want to hear more about all that and how their tech at Viasat is connecting consumers, businesses, governments and militaries on the ground, in the air and at sea. So buckle up. And hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to London, where John Reeves is waiting to share his story. So, a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about your journey, how you got here, and share your origin story? Yeah, absolutely. And first of all, thanks, Neil, for for having me. It's it's really a privilege to be here. Um, my name's John Reeves. I, I'm Managing Director of Viasat UK. Prior to joining Viasat, I actually uh, served in the U.S. government and the intelligence community. Um, I had the opportunity to travel and live overseas for for about 15 years and had a wonderful experience there. I, I originally hail from the Midwest in the United States, um, went to school in Chicago and, and uh, was looking really at the time and in, in starting my journey off in the uh, the finance world with investment banking, management consulting types of, of opportunities. And, and when I was in university, my final year, uh, September 11th happened and it really kind of shaped my trajectory. So it's been it's been a wonderful experience for me and in those 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 opportunities living overseas really put me in a position where I understood where I wanted to spend the next phase of my life and and that led me here to Viasat. And I'm conscious there will be people listening hearing about Viasat for the very first time. So for those people, can you just set the scene and tell them a little bit more about the kind of problems that you're solving for everything from consumers, businesses, governments and militaries on the ground, in the air, at sea? It seems that your, your tech is used just about everywhere, but can you uh, set the scene and tell everyone a little about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so Viasat is a really dynamic company and, you know, being... Um, having been a, a three-person defense startup back in 1986, um, it's a really innovative company. We've invented technology. Um, so it's a vibrant engineering atmosphere to be involved in. Um, what I really love about it, uh, not being an engineer personally, um, is, is that the technology and the company now finds itself at a really interesting in point in, in time in history, where we're sitting you know, square in the middle of this conversation around dual-use technology. And I think it's a really amazing time. I think we're talking a lot about how these technologies can be applied to, to meet a, a, a variety of government and military use cases, as you mentioned, across all domains. Um, but also when we look at what we're able to bring to, to the unconnected globally, right, or the underserved globally, there's a massive economic and, and social and political inclusion benefits um, that can be brought from our technology. And, and that's what we're doing today. We're connecting everyone from, from small uh, villages and in, in towns uh, in rural areas across the world to, uh, to residents um, watching you know, Netflix on their home internet, um, all the way through to senior VIPs who are some of the most demanding customers in the world. And here in the UK, the MI6 recently outlined plans to use technology developed by outside companies for the very first time. And this really struck a chord with me. So can you tell me a little bit more about why the government and bodies such as the MOD actually need to perform the same cultural shift? And is that something that you're seeing more and more too? Yeah. And this is a fascinating topic, Neil. I, I think that what, what we're seeing here is is something that I would just kind of refer to as opportunity. Right. Yeah. It's, it's the first time really where we're seeing the evolution of technologies that are sitting in this in this, you know, dual use intersection that can be leveraged to massively differentiate capabilities and in, in provide information advantage for folks in both the national security and uh, military and government context. So I think if you you look historically, it's, it's interesting because 
you know, government was always the place where technology was invented to meet these use cases, right, for um, specific government applications. Satellite communications technology is one of those areas. And as you've kind of followed that trajectory over time, what, what seems to happen is that technologies that are, that are born in government, as they evolve, folks in the private sector see opportunities to leverage those technologies eventually, right, and open new commercial markets. And we've seen that in areas like satellite communications, like mobile networking, um, you know, ARPANET programs leading to the internet. Um, I think that you've got some really amazing examples. And, and what happens is when, when industry gets a hold of some of these technologies, they invest in those technologies in a way that is not, not seen inside government, right? The money, money can flow at um, a, a magnitude that really drives these technologies forward um, and, and that's really heavily driven by, you know, how you can attract talent and, um, you know, how you can really um, turn quickly in terms of development cycles and, and iterate upon generations of products. And so we're, we find ourselves now at this time where some of those technologies that were, that were given birth to in, in the government space are now thought of as being commercial technologies, right? And so I think that as you, as you look at the landscape, you have this opportunity space that lies between this, if you think about it as, as being a graph, right? You have this exponential increase in terms of the growth trajectory of these technology areas. And then you have kind of a steady invention and innovation curve um, from, from defense and government programs. And those are you know, programs that are, that are you know, necessary to either continue in some areas or to, to create new programs. If you think about, you know, technologies where there's no current commercial business case, and I would offer, you know, situations like uh, directed energy or hypersonics, right, fit into that kind of bucket. But in this space in between those two curves, you really have massive opportunity. And that opportunity requires really close collaboration so that, so that, the folks on the technology side and in the, in the commercial space can really understand fundamentally the use cases and the requirements of government customers because they are different, right? It's not like you can just take a commercial technology that's on this trajectory and, and adapt that immediately to a government defense national security um, context. You actually have to be very thoughtful, right? Because of the security requirements that, that are around those, those uh, technologies. So I think it's really the opportunity lies in the collaboration that can take place between the government um, and in militaries and commercial entities. Um, trust obviously is key to that, right? In terms of enabling um, that activity to really result in operational capability. But I do think that, you know, the, the cultural shift piece, um, it's the MX6 comments in particular, I, I thought were really interesting and, and I think valuable in terms of the context of the conversation. Here in the UK, the MOD, of course, has outlined the national space strategy, defense space strategy. And I know that they're focused on leveraging the best available capabilities also that meet their needs. So I think the culture shift has started. Um, I, I do think that, you know, as, as we look at kind of the whole, uh, you know, the, the whole equation, you have to keep in mind that the chess pieces are where they are for a reason, right? Those technologies that we developed decades ago and invested in um, were very thoughtful programs, right? And they were just focused on a different um, type of, of problem at the time that was trying to be solved, you know? So if you think about, um, if you think about solving for, uh conflict during the Cold War era. It was more about creating, you know, munitions and platforms like ships and airplanes and, and that kind of a um, that kind of a, a requirement and development. And now we're in the information age, right? And, and just the reality is that those technologies are really being focused on and matured in the commercial space now. And we need to be thoughtful about how we can adapt those and adopt those to meet the emerging and current government and military use cases. And just to bring this subject to life a little bit, can you also expand on how and why using commercial technology can, with the right approach and controls in place, also offer opportunities to innovate, adapt and develop the best capabilities against the rise of these increasingly advanced and sophisticated adversaries? Because if we go back in time to when you first started as that three-man startup uh, or three-person startup uh, in the defence area, unfortunately, all these years later, we've still got the same problems, but the bad guys have got the same kind of technology and have become much more sophisticated too, haven't they? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that the technology landscape in the commercial domain has really leveled the playing field in, in a lot of areas, right? Um, where it used to be that, that you know, you had the bigger military budgets, for example, would drive 
innovation at a steeper uh, development trajectory. I think that I think that that now has been has been largely mitigated by some of the availability of commercial technology. So I think it's a really good point. I think that you know in terms of uh, the opportunity. I, a, I would say it's it's you know it, there's massive opportunities I mentioned before. I think that the 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 real um, the real question is is how can you uh, continue to differentiate at a rate that exceeds the capability of the adversary? I think that we need to be mindful of of how sophisticated they really have become. I'm not sure, you know, because this is evolving so quickly. I'm not sure how. Um, comfortable of a grasp we really have on that. Mm-hmm. And so I think that this is, you know, it's it's something that is um, obviously it's critical to our national and, and defense um, security, but it's not something that's been totally figured out yet. And I, and I think that it's why it's so important that we're having these conversations uh, currently to see how we can best adapt and adopt and develop these game-changing capabilities of the future. Um, in the face of this of this threat, and you know, in certain areas, Neil, it's it's a, a problem really of manpower when you think about the the data driven world and capabilities like artificial intelligence and machine learning. And when there's you know asymmetric capability just based on the amount of manpower available to some of the potential adversaries globally, I think that 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 should force us to really redouble our efforts to make sure that we're investing and in leveraging these technologies as smartly as possible to stay at least at pace with the adversary threat. And I appreciate, as this is a podcast that's being beamed around the world to people in 165 countries, there's probably only so much you can share, but what kind of tech needs to be in the hands of people in the field now? Is there anything you can share around that? So the technology needs of the field, I think, are, are first and foremost, right? We really need to recognize how we can how we can leverage technology to connect uh, each other. We have sophisticated systems Globally, and these are commercial systems as well. I was just talking to a colleague from Maxar the other day um, at a conference we were attending together, and in you know looking at the commercial technology that's being developed to provide Earth observation that's being used right for defense purposes um, around the world today. Um, we have sophisticated technologies that can be brought forward and are being leveraged in some pockets. Satellite communications technology is another one of those capabilities that can come forward, and I think that what we need to do is. Again, you know, balance this technology innovation that's happening in the commercial space with with those technologies I just mentioned, and understand how they can fundamentally better connect folks, such that those bespoke investments that are being made to deliver asymmetric capability within governments um, can actually have the infrastructure needed um, to support the end users. Right? I mean, the the tools that are being developed from an Earth observation perspective, for example, or when you read about what's happening in the United States around uh, multi-domain operations, right, and sensor to shooter types of activities, right, that, that are being discussed. I mean, you really, it's about connectivity and trusted connectivity and making sure that that you have resilient communications architectures and infrastructure in place so that you can truly exploit those other types of capabilities. So I think, you know, we've got, um, we, we've got to get technology out there fielded. I think it starts with um, the culture piece, right, that, that you asked about previously, um, you know, because there's the the kind of acquisition culture piece, and then there's also the how do we actually deploy the technology. And I think that that is that's another piece of the equation that I think is really critical. I, I think that requires experimentation. I think that requires more opportunities um, for technology to be put into the hands of people in the field that could potentially change the way that they operate. And I say potentially because some of it might not be useful, right? And industry needs to know that so that we can actually invest in the types of technologies that will move the needle and will provide that type of advantage in in the battle space. And of course, in businesses and everywhere in life now, it's very easy to get carried away with the next shiny big thing in technology without looking at the problems that you want to solve and also the capabilities of those technologies. Is there anything uh, that you'd like to add around that at all? Absolutely. I, in this space, I, I think you know we're now bombarded right, with yeah. terminology such as you know, 5G or um, zero trust. And, you know, you could go down a whole list, right, of these kind of buzzword technologies that I think are viewed as being the the perfect solution to solve a lot of problems. And I would just, I would caution against thinking about the technology ecosystem in that way, especially as it's applied to defense. I mean, first, you know, these technologies are not, they're not going to be perfect. 
none of these technologies are going to be perfect. We're never going to feel that we have the perfect solution for these problems because the landscape's always evolving, right? And as, as you asked uh, previously, Neil, about the sophisticated adversaries, I think this is a critical piece of that also, is that the, the landscape is ever evolving. And in order to then really focus on how do we provide the best capability to our end users, it is really truly focusing on what is the mission outcome that we want to have in a given situation. I don't think that we should be thinking about it through the lens of a specific technology. I think the variety of technologies that we could discuss, you know, the in the communication space alone, right? You could talk about line of sight, tactical data links, um, mesh radios, uh, cellular infrastructure that includes 5G. You could talk about satellite communications, right? There are all kinds of different types of technology, fiber infrastructure, I didn't mention. All of those technologies can be useful if applied to, to create a mission outcome that you desire. And I think that's really where we need to focus, right? What is, what is the point of, of running a 10-year acquisition program that ultimately takes you three years or so to write the initial requirement for? And by the time that you've written the initial requirement for that, right, the technology has moved maybe two or three generations beyond where you started the program. Um, so I think thinking about it as an operational outcome that you want to achieve and thinking about it then through the lens of capability and how can you get to the to the maximum capability in the shortest amount of time and then iterate upon that baseline, I think is is where our heads should be vice thinking about specific technology solving world hunger. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And do you think it's also about the importance of having a hybrid approach, using a combination of technologies to deliver end users with that connectivity and services that they need? Because you need all of that together, don't you? You really do. And it's and it's how can you smartly leverage those tools that you have at your disposal, right? To to solve the problems that you have in front of you. And I think you know, we, we, we could use very easy examples of this, right? I mean, we don't have, um, if, I, if I think about my SUV at home as an example, right? My SUV is great at doing some jobs. Uh, it is not great at doing every job, right? I don't want to get on, you know, the, the racetrack in Miami last weekend with Lewis Hamilton, right? Um, in my SUV, I'm going to lose. He might beat me, right? If he's driving my SUV and I'm in his car. Um, but that's another story. So I, I think, you know, if you think about the fact that you really want to match the technology to the job to be done, I think that that then you can start to see how a hybrid approach makes a lot of sense that that's not easy to do. Um, but I think that that is definitely the right approach. And I think that what we're doing on the on the connectivity side is really matching the best available connectivity. And it doesn't have to be satellite communications. Right. I mean, we work heavily in satellite communications, but we also are a business that's heavily focused in the tactical battle space um, in bringing together all of those different transport paths that I mentioned a minute ago. And if you think about that, then it is about, it is about using the best path available to you to conduct your specific application, right? I mean, it could be application by application um, driven. And we've, we've done a bit of this in terms of just managing our residential network and, and uh, how we provide service on that front so that we can optimize right around the use cases that our customers really uh, care most deeply about to do their job. And I think what makes Viasat stand out for me is the fact that your technology can help everyone from armed personnel to paramedics or just somebody living in a remote village. But again, to, to bring that to life, are there any use cases that you can share just to help everyone listening understand how it works in the world and how it might work in their world too? Yeah, absolutely. So, so when we look at different use cases right now, we have thousands of uh, towns in rural places in, in Mexico um, in in a couple of locations in Africa where we're connecting the unconnected, right? We, we looked at, at infrastructure and realized that there was a gap. And so we were able to, to connect folks in those areas and understanding that, you know, obviously the uh, the level of economic activity in these regions is not what you would expect in a city center um, uh, such as London. Um, you need to be able to be flexible in in terms of how you deliver that service. And so we've been very thoughtful about how we can connect folks um, to to the world um, using our technology. We've got some great examples of that. it's It's been a wonderful program. and it's you know connecting connecting people to to education and and health resources, right? What we've been 
uh, working on relative to, to telemedicine applications, for example. There's so much benefit, I think, that, that these types of architectures um, and technologies can bring to, to, uh, to places that are currently underserved. And I think that's really valuable. I think, you know, we've, we've had a, uh, another couple of examples where here in the UK, we provided uh, in concert with a couple of uh, international organizations and development agencies, uh, satellite infrastructure for ambulances so that we could better connect ambulances um, that were operating in rural areas that were often unconnected. I think that's a, another good example. And uh, one that I got to participate in that's along those lines was in 2018, NATO held its emergency response exercise, which was the first NATO activity in Serbia since uh, the early 2000s. Um, and it was focused on, on providing uh, telemedicine services using our connectivity equipment um, in a resilient context where you've lost infrastructure as a result of an earthquake. And we were able to help participate in this, in this exercise that included 2,000 participants from over 140 different countries in the world. And I think that what you saw through an example um, such as that is that you saw the collaborative nature that I talked about earlier and, and how you could work side by side with the medical teams um, that were responsible for, for triaging and providing care. And we could help to make sure that our system right, was optimized to meet their needs in that context and work shoulder to shoulder together to make sure that, that we could address um, that emergency response scenario. So I think you know, when you, when you th the same types of, you know, obviously the same types of uh, analogies apply to some of the things we've done in the defense space, but, but I really do think that the, uh, the way that this technology can be applied is, is, is frankly, it is uh, inspiring because we have yet to really unlock all of the use cases available um, to pulling these types of technologies together and seeing how we can uh, together, right, working with partners and governments, um, really bring more value and, uh, and capability to areas that deserve it. And I think that's a part that's quite exciting, and especially as you're unlocking new opportunities and, as you said, giving the technology to those that deserve it. But I'm curious, what makes you hopeful about the future and even excited about the road ahead for what you're doing at Viasat? Well, I'm incredibly excited about uh, the Viasat 3 constellation, yeah. the satellite constellation that we've been, been working on um, for the past few years really going to be a differentiated capability um, in terms of how it operates, the number of users that it will be able to support, and not just that we'll be able to connect, but we'll be able to connect um, in a really valuable and meaningful way because of the amount of capacity that we're going to be able to deliver through that satellite infrastructure. Uh, I think, again, it's for me, it's looking at how can we work uh, collaboratively with partners to make the best use of that infrastructure. Um, and I think that's that's really exciting. There's obvious economic opportunity there um, to connect folks. Um, I think that you know using an example like I mentioned with the connecting uh, underserved populations in Africa, we have startups all over the world. Some here in London, right? Obviously focused on the financial uh, services industry that see massive opportunity um, economically in the developing world and can also help obviously bring benefit to those areas in terms of. Uh, bringing additional infrastructure. And currently, the business case for getting some of those technologies deployed in areas of need uh, is really held back by the cost of power and the cost of uh, infrastructure in terms of connectivity. So as you see the, the growth in, in available capacity, which is going to be brought forward in large part by ISAT 3 I think you're going to see massive opportunity um, for partnership that's, you know, while we'll talk about it, as being um, in, in some cases, a financial services type of startup or what have you, our infrastructure is going to be the backbone for a number of those really exciting capabilities and technologies. So it's fun for me to be able to be a part of it. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful organization and, and seeing us poised for significant growth, I think is a really fantastic thing. Love that and love chatting with you today. But before I let you go, I always like to end on a bit of a, a fun note and ask uh, you as a guest if you can leave us with something that inspires you. And that could be a favorite song or book or a song that gets your head in the zone before you go on stage or you need to do some work, whatever it might be. Do you have a song that we could add to our Spotify playlist? Uh, I, I do. I have a song for you. And I don't believe that it's on your list. I actually... Um, I, I did have a chance to, to take a look at your list, um, and there was a song on there that I was going to, to select potentially, um, 
but uh, but I've decided instead to go with Closing Time by Semisonic. Um, now, I choose that song um, for a couple of reasons. One, a very personal one, which is that on my first date with my wife, um, uh, many years ago now, um, we were at a coffee shop and that was the last song that they played at the close of business. Um, and so that was a memorable experience, obviously, in terms of uh, tying that to a very important event in my life. Um, and, and similarly, though, as I look at the lyrics of that song, what always kind of resonated with me is the fact that it's about a journey. Um, it's about the experiences that we've had and it's about uh, continuing to move forward. And I think that that's, that's really important to me. It's, it's, it's the way that I, I think I've always tried to approach um, my life. And I've had some wonderful experiences living all over the world um, and, and identifying with, with different cultures in terms of, you know, really being able to understand um, parts of the world that I never thought that I would have the ability to experience. And, and so, you know, this, this feeling of continuing to move forward, continuing to um, recognize that we're on a journey and that, uh, and that there's more to come and that you can appreciate the past, but it's all about moving forward, I think is, is a, uh, something that really resonates with me. So thanks for letting me share. No, thank you for bringing that back to my attention. I'd long forgotten about that song. I always remember there's a great line in there, something like every new beginning comes with some other beginnings end. Great song. I completely forgot about that. So I'll get that added to our Spotify playlist. And for everyone listening that just wants to find out more information about Viasat, what's the best way of finding you guys online and contacting your team if they've got any additional questions? Well, the best starting point would be Viasat.com. That's V-I-A-S-A-T.com. Um, and you can learn more about our defense business at viasat.com slash defense. I'll note that that's with an S, not a C. I have to remind myself of that too, with all the time I spend in the UK. Um, and then you can also follow us on our Viasat government LinkedIn page or at viasat.gov on Twitter. So thanks so much for, uh, for, for taking a look at that, Neil. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I've learned so much talking about all the different uh, industries that you're serving here and the great work that you're doing. And as you said, you're only just beginning to unlock even more use cases for that. So I'd love to stay in touch with you and see how your journey evolves and those new use cases that get unlocked along the way. But more than anything, thank you for sitting down, sharing your story, also leaving us with a great song that I'd forgotten about too. But thank you for joining me today. No, thanks so much, Neil. I really appreciate the opportunity. A big, big thank you to John for discussing the importance of a hybrid approach, You all by using a combination of technologies to deliver end users the connectivity and services that they need. Because after all, the person on the ground, whether armed personnel, a paramedic or someone living in a remote village, they don't care how their service arrives. They just care that it does arrive. In much the same way, if you're sat in an office listening to this podcast, when you get in in the morning, you just want your tech to work and those critical applications to open and no dramas. Sounds simple, doesn't it? But it's not always the case. So a big thank you to John for sharing his story today. I invite you to share your questions and pictures to come on the show or whatever it might be by emailing me, techblogwriteroutlook.com, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram at Neil C. Hughes. And my website is techblogwriter.co.uk. And remember, if you are heading to Vegas for the... Cisco live event, hit me up and I will come and join you for a little chat on the show floor. And there'll be no awkwardness, I guarantee you that. (laughs) Okay, so keep those messages coming in. Thank you for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.